The pot and jar cards are a series of cards that are usually centered around drawing or adding cards from your deck to your hand, and as a result have seen a wide amount of competitive play for their own unique reasons. In this video we're going to focus on the best pot and jar cards in the game, why they're so strong and what kind of decks are capable of using them. And at number 10 we have Jar of Avarice, a normal trap card with an effect meant to mirror its slightly more famous counterpart, Pot of Avarice. You can only activate one Jar of Avarice per turn, and in order to use it, you need to target any 5 cards in your graveyard, apart from other copies of itself, and then you can shuffle those cards into the deck in order to draw one card. While drawing a card is a pretty decent effect to have, most strategies will choose to avoid a card like Jar of Avarice for a few reasons. It being a trap card makes it comparatively much slower than when compared to other draw one cards like Upstart Goblin and Into the Void, since you don't get any immediate value out of the card. But what really hurts Jar of Avarice for most strategies is just how much setup it requires. While cards like Upstart Goblin or even Jar of Greed are act available with no setup at all, Jar of Avarice requires you to seed your graveyard with at least 5 cards in order to use. For some strategies, this is feasible, but most decks either can't set up their graveyard with the necessary cards or simply don't want to because their graveyard acts as a second resource. And by shuffling 5 cards back into your deck would be depriving yourself of powerful graveyard effects, like the Paleozoic Trap cards or the Infernoids. Yet despite this effect usually being the card's main detriment, some decks have managed to use this effect strictly for their own benefit in order to recycle their engine pieces. Necroz, for example, was a deck capable of ritual summoning up monsters by using materials from your extra deck with Necroz Kaleidoscope, but would require multiple spots in your extra deck that would have been used on tech cards if you wanted to use Kaleidoscope multiple times over the course of the game. Jar of Avarice, however, allowed you to play the minimum number of extra deck monsters required for your ritual summons, since you could just shuffle them back for your next turn. Even despite how slow the card is, Jar of Avarice has even managed to see competitive play in the modern era as a tech choice for Mystic Mind decks, where it can shuffle back any of your spawn traps in your graveyard to prevent you from decking out before you get to final countdown. Or alternatively, it could be used to shuffle back any stray Exodia pieces that have found their way to the graveyard throughout the course of the duel that otherwise would have lost you the game if they had left your hand. In these cases, Jar of Avarice's ability to recur is actually slightly better than Pot of Avarice, since you can shuffle back any card in the game and not just monster cards making Jar a lot more easy to use for strategies that use alternative win conditions. Overall, Jar of Avarice is definitely one of the weaker Jar cards due to its mediocre draw effect and how it can hamper graveyard strategies, but it manages to fill a specific niche that few other Pot and Jar cards can, giving decks the ability to recur the required engine pieces, and unlike a card like a Transmigration Prophecy, even gives you a bonus draw which isn't awful since it's always going to be a net neutral in card advantage, even if it is a bit slow and sometimes awkward to set up. And at number 9, we have Jar of Greed, another normal trap card with one of the shortest and most simple card effects in the game. With no cost, restriction, or activation requirement, Jar of Greed lets you draw a card from your deck. Like with Jar of Avarice, Jar of Greed's draw effect isn't actually that amazing. It does thin your deck by one, but it being a trap card makes it incredibly slow and unappealing for most strategies, since they could just run other cards with draw one for an immediate payoff, and unlike Jar of Avarice, Jar of Greed doesn't have the ability to recur cards in the graveyard. So why does Jar of Greed make it to this list above Jar of Avarice? You see, Jar of Avarice needs a lot of setup. Jar of Greed, on the other hand, can be activated at any point during either player's turn after it's been set up. And this level of chain ability makes Jar of Greed really valuable. Such as in Chain Burn decks, where you build up huge chain links using cards like Ojama Trio, Just Desserts, and of course, Jar of Greed, in order to build up big chain links for cards like Accumulated Fortune, and more importantly, Chain Strike, in order to burn your opponent for a ton of damage. And Jar of Greed lets you draw a free card from your deck while doing so, allowing you to recur advantage and potentially draw into another strong burn card like Secret Barrel in order to finish off your opponent. This level chain ability wasn't just a boon in chain burn strategies either, it was also highly coveted by Paleozoic decks, who could get a free draw from Jar of Greed while also having an opportunity to trigger the graveyard effects of their Paleozoic trap cards and bring them to the field. Jar of Greed's effect, like Jar of Avarice, is overall pretty weak but Jar of Greed still managed to see a decent amount of competitive play for how easy it is to activate, allowing for it to reach staple status for certain strategies. And at number 8, we have Cyber Jar, a level 3 flip monster that was once capable of winning games on its own. When it's flipped face up, you must destroy all monsters in the field, then have both players reveal the top 5 cards of their deck. Then both players get to special summon any revealed level 4 or lower monsters to the field in face up attack position, or face down defense position, with the rest of the cards revealed being added to their hands. While flip monsters are usually deemed too slow for the modern game, flip monsters used to be some of the most broken cards in the game, with cards like Magician of Faith and Raiko being some of the strongest and most meta-defining cards of their era, but few flip monsters can match the strength of Cyber Jar. You see, Cyber Jar had a dual purpose. The first was that it was essentially an extra three copies of Dark Hole and could be used to clear away your opponent's problematic boss monsters that would have otherwise been difficult to out. 
But as well as dealing with your opponent's board, Cyberjar was also capable of bringing you back into the game from a completely unwinnable position with the second half of its effect. Because no matter what you reveal off of Cyberjar, you're always guaranteed to gain value off of its effect. If you reveal a lot of monsters, you get an insane amount of board presence for free, potentially gaining extremely strong removal options like Exiled Force and DD Warrior Lady to deal with whatever your opponent summons, recruiters like Sangan Mystic Tomato in order to keep the board presence, or even other great flip effect monsters like Magician of Faith, or even other copies of Cyberjar to use its effect again. In contrast, anything you reveal that isn't level 4 or lower goes to your hand, and this includes both level 5 or higher monsters and Speller Trap cards. So, with a single Cyberjar, you could suddenly gain a handful of powerful monsters like Jinzo, or more importantly, a handful of busted spell and traps like Monster Reborn, Snatch Deal, or something like Delinquent Duo, providing you with enough resources either to form a counterattack or overwhelm your opponent if you are already in a winning position. In fact, both sides of Cyber Jar were so strong that it saw a ton of widespread play. For Chaos strategies to add cards like Chaos Sorcerer to your hand, Burn strategies could use it in order to dig for their strongest back row, and other decks could use it to quickly swarm the field. The effect was deemed so strong that Cyberjar was eventually banned in the TCG, where it has stayed banned to this day. Although, despite its status on the Forbidden Limited list, Cyberjar is a lot less usable in the modern era due to how slow its effect is. While certainly powerful in its own right, flip monsters are inherently slow due to needing to be set for a turn before they can be used, allowing your opponent to combo off and build a board of negates before you have a chance to activate it. And there's no guarantee that even if Cyberjar does resolve, it helps you more than your opponent, as while it allows you to swarm the field with strong monsters while adding powerful spell and traps to your hand, it also allows for your opponent to do the same, potentially giving them an even better hand or field than they had previously. In essence, Cyberjar shouldn't be underestimated and was once a staple of competitive play, though in the modern era, it's far too risky of an investment and would be way too slow to see modern use, even if it did end up coming off the list. And at number 7, we have Morphing Jar the second flip jar monster on this list, and like Cyber Jar, one of the strongest flip monsters in the game. Whenever Morphing Jar is flipped face up, both players must discard their entire hand to the graveyard, and then each player draws five cards. And just like with Cyber Jar, this effect allowed Morphing Jar to be a competitive staple in older formats, as it was usable in any deck as an easy way to refresh your hand and dig deeper into your deck for your best cards. But in comparison to Cyber Jar, Morphing Jar appears much weaker, as not only does it not clear the field, it forces you to discard your entire hand and doesn't even help you swarm. Yet despite these factors, Morphing Jar has managed to see more competitive play than its robotic counterpart even before Cyber Jar was banned. You see, what really separated Morphing Jar and Cyber Jar was the ability to set up your graveyard. By discarding your hand, you can seed your graveyard without needing to commit monsters to the field like you would with Cyber Jar. And Chaos Next would use this ability to great effect. Using Morphing Jar to dig into the deck for Blackluster Soldier Envoy at the beginning also allowed you to discard your light and dark monsters to the graveyard making your Chaos Monsters a lot easier to summon. Morphing Jar was even a staple in Dark Arm Dragon decks too, since it was a dark monster with an effect that allowed you to more consistently find Dark Arm Dragon, while also putting dark monsters in your graveyard in order to fulfill its summoning condition. Now, like Cyber Jar, Morphing Jar doesn't really see too much competitive play due to how fast the format is. Yet, unlike Cyber Jar, Morphing Jar has an entire FTK centered around it. Because Morphing Jar isn't once per turn, if you can find a way to constantly keep flipping Morphin Jar up and down, you can keep discarding and drawing cards until your opponent has no cards left in their deck, which is the main idea behind Empty Jar, utilizing tools like A&D Changer, Book of Moon, alongside the Animancipators in order to go into Gallant Granite to search for or special summon Morphin Jar. Overall, Morphin Jar is a deceptively powerful card, and while slow in the current metagame, it was a staple choice for decks, especially graveyard-reliant ones during slower formats and even as late as 2014. And although its FDK isn't the most viable strategy, it's still played in the modern era. And at number 6, we have Pot of Avarice, a normal spell card which inspired the effect of Jar of Avarice. And like Jar of Avarice, a Pot of Avarice allows you to recycle your graveyard into your deck in order to draw cards. Although with Pot of Avarice, you need to target 5 monsters in your graveyard to shuffle back, rather than just 80 cards. And when you shuffle them back, you draw 2 cards instead of 1. Now, there are a lot of factors which make Pot of Avarice a valuable card for both halves of its effect. Drawing two cards is, of course, an absurdly strong effect, and one that mirrors the banned card Pot of Greed, as it's just a straight plus one in terms of card advantage. Although Pot of Avarice is a much worse card when compared to Pot of Greed, as unlike Pot of Greed, Pot of Avarice requires a lot of setup in order to use and can occasionally deprive your graveyard of resources. In slower formats, this wasn't too much of an issue, as duels usually lasted much longer, meaning it was a lot easier to get the required setup in order to activate Avarice over the course of a duel, allowing for multiple strategies to take advantage of it. So much so that Pot of Avarice was banned in 2014, only to come off the list completely in 2020. 
However, in the modern era, while Pot of Avarice can appear appealing, it's a card that's only really played in strategies that can immediately get advantage of its effect by seeding the grave with monsters as early as possible. Danger Dark World strategies, for example, can use Pot of Avarice extremely easily. Since you're discarding so many cards and putting them in the graveyard on your first turn, you can easily set up the required monsters in the graveyard in order to draw two with Avarice. But the decks that could take advantage of Pot of Avarice the best were the ones that could also take advantage of its recycling ability. Zodiac and Sky Strikers were both the decks that could natively run Pot of Avarice due to how easily they could seek their graveyard with extra deck monsters. And Avarice would eventually become a staple in these strategies when some of their strongest monsters, Kagari and Dryden, were put on the limited list, as Avarice allowed you to put back your Kagari or Dryden to use for your next turn while also drawing two cards for free. Pot of Avarice is a supremely strong card that, in slower format, would likely still be banned and is only solo on this list due to the speed of the current format, which turns it from a generic tool and a free draw too into a card that only really works for specific strategies, a trait which is shared with the next card on this list. And at number 5, we have Pot of Duality, a normal spell card with one of the more interesting pot effects. While most pot cards cause you to draw cards, Pot of Duality instead lets you look at the top three cards of your deck and then add one of them to your hand while shuffling the rest back into your deck. But you can only activate Pot of Duality once per turn, and you're also locked out of special summoning for the entirety of the turn. Being locked out of special summoning for the whole turn is a huge downside of the card, and as a result, Pot of Duality in the modern metagame is more often than not relegated to decks that don't care about this restriction. Flow and Deree's decks, for example, can benefit from consistency boosts that Duality provides, since they don't special summon at all. Meanwhile, decks like Dinomorphia can use Duality since they only special summon during their opponent's turn. But you might be surprised to know that despite its harsh restrictions, Pot of Duality used to be a staple in almost every deck. See, while Pot of Duality is only net neutral in card advantage, it allows you to add the specific card you need from the top three of your deck, rather than just giving you a random card draw. This can allow you to dig for your most important cards, letting you add a starter for your next turn, a hand trap, or even a turn-ending trap card like Dimensional Barrier, depending on what's in your hand and what cards you've excavated. Although the decks that were best suited for Pot of Duality were ones that didn't need to special summon that much, like Cleefort. Pot of Duality even saw competitive play in combo-heavy strategy to special summon a lot, purely because the level of consistency that Pot of Duality provided was unmatched, and in comparison to a card like Pot of Avarice, was activatable immediately. For what Pot of Duality lacks in pure card advantage, it makes up for in card quality. And although its time as a competitive staple in most decks has passed due to its harsh restriction, any deck that can play duality has an absolutely stellar consistency tool to help you find your best cards. And its effect and artwork have even inspired some of the strongest pot cards in the game, such as the next pot on this list. And at number 4, we have Pot of Extravagance, another normal spell card which has become a modern staple consistency card. But like with the previous two entries, not every deck can play it. You can only activate Pot of Extravagance at the start of your main phase 1, and when you do, you need to banish either 3 or 6 random cards from your extra deck face down, then you get to draw a card for every 3 cards you banish, letting you draw 2 cards if you banish a maximum of 6 cards. But for the rest of the turn, you can't draw any cards by card effects. Compared to most of the cards in this list, Pot of Extravagance has a lot of restrictions, which can make it difficult to use. It can only be activated at the very beginning of your main phase, so if you happen to draw into it later on in the turn, you have a dead card in your hand. And it even locks you to drawing for the rest of the turn, stopping you from using other consistency tools that draw, such as other pot cards or even drawing from danger monster effects. Yet, these harsh restrictions aren't what keeps Extravagance from seeing play in almost every deck. It's actually just that cost. Currently, most extra decks are built as a toolbox with a number of options and engine pieces to cover the most likely situations to happen. And the best way to maximize the number of extra deck options you have is by playing an extra deck full of one-ups. This line of thinking can be counterintuitive when using Pot of Extravagance, as Extravagance randomly banishes up to 6 of your extra deck options, preventing you from either using your end board pieces, your engine pieces, or even your OTK enablers. With such a harsh cost, how does Pot of Extravagance make it so high on this list? You see, certain strategies, like control strategies, don't really use their extra deck too much in order to win games. So in decks like Elf Lich, they can use Pot of Extravagance as if they were the exact same card as Pot of Greed, not needing to worry about cards being ripped from their extra deck. But even if you're playing a strategy that needs their extra deck, you can still benefit greatly from Extravagance. Instead of building their extra deck with 15 specific one-ofs in order to cover as many situations as possible, some strategies would instead build their extra deck with only 5 specific monsters instead, and play 3 copies in order to use Pot of Extravagance. This way, even though you're banishing almost half your extra deck, there's a very small chance you end up banishing 3 copies of the same card, letting you use Extravagance without needing to worry about randomly banishing your best cards. Overall, Pot of Extravagance isn't the easiest card to use, it has restrictions and a harsh cost which makes it appear unappealing at first, but if your deck can play Pot of Extravagance, 
either through not caring about your extra deck or through clever deck building, you essentially have a free draw too. And at number three, we have Pot of Desires, another normal spell designed to mirror Pot of Greed. You can only activate one Pot of Desires per turn, and if you do, you have to banish the top 10 cards of your deck face down in order to draw two cards. Now, because of this cost, not every deck can play Pot of Desires. Banishing 10 cards on top of your deck can prove quite detrimental for strategies that require specific engine pieces in their deck. Some decks, for example, often run Artifact Scythe as a way to lock your opponent out of their extra deck by summoning it during your opponent's turn. But if you happen to banish that Artifact Scythe using Desires, you've essentially lost a key engine piece that could have potentially won you the game. Because for decks that run specific engine pieces, Desires Banish is just too random to control. However, if your deck runs multiple copies of all of its engine pieces, it becomes extremely unlikely to end up banishing three copies of the same card. Not impossible, but just very unlikely. Sword Soul decks, for example, are easily capable of running Desires as every Sword Soul monster is ran at either two or three copies, allowing for Desires to basically act as a free pot of greed, giving you free consistency tool to find your engine pieces, hand traps, or powerful side cards. Some strategies even manage to use Desires cost to their advantage. The priorly mentioned Sword Soul can use Desires in order to trigger the effect of Sword Soul's Supreme Sovereign Changing, while also boosting its attack. And Grand Maji to Isa decks can use Pot of Desires as both a consistency tool and an OTK enabler, as a single Desire boosts Grand Maji's attack to 4000. Just like with Pot of Extravagance, Pot of Desires needs clever deck building in order to use its full effect. But if you build your deck with multiples of your engine pieces, Desires basically just becomes a Pot of Greed and unlike Extravagance, doesn't restrict you in any way or get rid of your important deck options. Although the next card on this list has a bit more in common with Extravagance. And at number two, we have Pot of Prosperity, a normal spell that's designed as an evolved form of Pot of Duality. Just like with Extravagance, in order to use Prosperity, you need to banish either three or six of your extra deck cards face down in order to use it, but unlike Extravagance, you actually get to choose the cards you banish instead. Then, once you banish those cards, you get to reveal cards from the top of your deck equal to the number of cards you banish, and then add one of those revealed cards to your hand and place the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order you desire. However, Prosperity also has a ton of restrictions on its effect, even when compared to Pot of Extravagance. You can only activate one Pot of Prosperity per turn, and you also can't draw cards by card effects at all the turn you activate it, and any damage your opponent takes is also halved. But despite all of these restrictions and its cost, Pot of Prosperity is one of the strongest consistency cards in the game. You see, most of the good pot cards are incredibly strong since they act as a way to gain easy card advantage, allowing you to thin your deck and see extra cards that could be important. But one of the key downsides to most of the pot cards is that the cards you get are random. There's no guarantee that the cards you draw are going to be of value or even usable. With something like Pot of Desires, you could draw onto your bricks, other copies of cards you already have in hand, or even a second copy of Desires. But with cards like Pot of Duality and Pot of Prosperity, you can dig deeper into your deck to find specific cards you need, rather than gaining a random draw, letting you gain a better quality card, even if you're not gaining more quantity. In fact, Pot of Prosperity is even better than Pot of Duality, as you can look at the top six cards of your deck rather than just the top three. And what's even better than that, while you're still restricted in a lot of ways, you can still special summon under Prosperity. And while the cost may make it seem like you need to build your extra deck a certain way, just like with Extravagance, the fact that you get to choose what to banish, rather than it being random, means that you can instead choose to banish the extra deck options that are least likely to come up, while also keeping all of your best cards. So with Prosperity, you have an easy way to dig really deep in your deck to find your best cards. And this becomes even more impressive after siding, as you can use Prosperity to find specific silver bullets or board breakers to deal with your opponent's board, making it a must negate card during games two and three. Prosperity does come with a lot of restrictions which can prevent you from OTKing or drawing cards, but these are relatively minor downsides when compared to the huge boost in consistency Prosperity provides, and is only really outdone by the best pot card in the game. And greedily, taking the number one spot as the best pot and jar card in the game is Pot of Greed. There has been a lot of confusion about what Pot of Greed actually does, but to settle the debate, it's a normal spell card which allows you to draw two cards from your deck with no restrictions, no cost, no once per turn, and no downsides. A lot of cards in this list can act as a stand-in for Pot of Greed for certain strategies. Pot of Desires is basically Pot of Greed for decks with three ofs, Pot of Extravagance is a Pot of Greed for decks that don't care about their extra deck, and Pot of Avarice is a Pot of Greed for decks that can see their graveyard. Yet none of these cards can claim to be as easy to use and as splashable as Pot of Greed, as you can activate it without any setup unlike Avarice, without paying any cost unlike Desires, and without any restrictions unlike Extravagance. It doesn't even come with a once per turn, so in theory, you can Pot of Greed to draw into a Pot of Greed to then draw into another Pot of Greed. Essentially, any deck that wants consistency and card advantage can and would play Pot of Greed, which just so happens to be every deck in the game. 
You see, unlike a lot of other card games, Yu-Gi-Oh! has no mana or dedicated resource system. Instead, the resource system is the cards you have in your hand instead. This is why most of the pot cards in this list are extremely powerful, as they either get you more resources or provide you with the ability to gain a highly valuable resource as well as consistency. But despite how good these cards are, they're not playable in every single deck. However, if Pot of Greed were legal, there's no doubt that every single deck in the game would play it, as it's just a free and easy way to draw two cards. And during the time where Pot of Greed was actually legal, virtually every deck did play it since it was just free card advantage, and act as a quicker way to get access to your best cards, a way to form a comeback after using up all of your other resources, or as a way to close out the game if you're already ahead. While many other cards will try to mimic Pot of Greed's power, few other cards in the game will ever be able to match its simplicity, power, and ease of use which is why it is by far the best pot or jar card in the game. Alright, and that's the list. If there are any other pot or jar cards we may have missed, or do you have any ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below. 